Good evening, everybody. I'd like to all welcome you to the uh, bi-monthly meeting of the Community Relations Committee of the Health and Hospital Corporation. Um, it's good to see all of you. We know that we have our usual one hour set aside because the cab board must meet afterwards. So we'll make sure that we'll move through our agenda quickly, but rapidly, but make sure that we also take care of our business. Um, I'd like to call before we go into anything else for a motion to adopt the minutes of March 7th, our last meeting. I have to poll each one of the members for their, his or her vote. First, our, our chairman. Yes. All president? Yes. Ms. Adams? Yes. Okay. I believe that those are the only board members that are here. I vote yes also. So it's unanimous for nothing. So the minutes of the last meeting on March 7th are adopted unanimously. Um, I'd like you to all mark your calendars, especially if you're in the Bronx of Brooklyn. We have two meetings that remain of the public hearings that are held each year. Uh, the Bronx meeting is on May 16th at Jacoby Hospital, and the Brooklyn meeting is on Tuesday, June 13th at Woodhall. So especially for you in the Bronx and in Brooklyn, or for anybody else who hasn't had a chance to make the other borough hearings, but you can testify in either one of those boroughs. And please make your call here into the board office and sign up so that we can hear from all of you. And you'll register in advance by calling Ms. Galicia Hercules, our secretary, at 212-788-3360. And if you didn't get that whole number, you can come back to me at the meeting and I'll give it to you again. We are planning on having five different hospitals report. I'd like to first ask if uh, Mr. Evans is here from uh, Health and Hospitals at Cumberland. He's, He's what? That's what I wanted to hear. Thank you so much. <laughs> so we will then move on and I will introduce Matthew Levy representing Seaview for the Seaview report. Yes, good evening. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Nolan. Uh, my name is Matthew Levy. I'm the CEO at Seaview, which is located in Staten Island. I'm here reporting on behalf of uh, Mr. George Marino, our cab chair, who is not able to be here. Uh, so since the beginning of the pandemic, um, Seaview has maintained an active COVID-19 response program. The safety of our population and residents remains our top priority. Uh, in the nursing home space, in the post-acute space, uh, with the high uh, amount of regulation, uh, COVID-19 is something that we deal oh. with on a daily basis. And while that has sort of, uh, uh, the requirements have reduced a bit over time, uh, we still maintain an active infection control approach here. Uh, we have retract, continue to track and report all sus suspected cases uh, uh, to the Department of Health and CMS on a weekly basis. Thankfully, to date, we have had no additional cases. It's been about three or four months, uh, and we are doing very well from that perspective. Uh, as we move on to equipment and infrastructure, uh, we have identified that through the pandemic, there would be, uh, if we can I, I purchase some additional equipment, uh, would be helpful for the nursing staff and for the physicians uh, to help catch uh, infections earlier and intervene. Uh, therefore, uh, we are working with uh, infrastructure uh, to purchase new uh, uh, blood pressure machines uh, that will then uh, sort of interface with our EHR uh, and uh, vital signs can be reported uh, rather quickly. Um, and our uh, occupational health service and, and uh, clinic department is also seeking uh, to purchase bladder scanner which would, of course, reduce the need for off-site clinics to your uh, urology and better, uh, better help uh, recognize changes in condition for our residents. One of the things we're very proud at Seaview about is one is our uh, overall patient satisfaction scores. Uh, we we currently are uh, have an overall satisfaction in final ranking scores at or above 95 percentile, uh, which is compared to one of the highest in the nation. Uh, we have just re we were uh, uh, honored to be uh, named the uh, highest performing nursing home in New York State by Newsweek. So we are very proud of that. And uh, patient satisfaction really is at the forefront of all we do. Of course, clinical care is important, but we really want to ensure that the level of service being provided bedside uh, matches the, uh, the the level of care being provided. Uh, during the pandemic, we saw the obvious complaints that I'm sure everybody else faced as well. It was, uh, you know, access to uh, loved ones seeing their their patients in the facilities, which 
I will say technology really helped uh, in deliver uh, what we call bedside visits uh, for families at the height of the pandemic. And then as things started to uh, become a bit less restrictive, uh, visitors needed to be tested when they came into the facility uh, before they can go to the unit and see their loved one, uh, bar barring some significant uh, situations called compassionate care visits. Uh, but uh, since this report, the requirements for testing have stopped. Nursing home visitors are no longer required to test uh, before they before they see their loved one. Uh, let me see what else we have here. Issues impacting the community service by the design. Uh, I have to tell you, uh, we would not have done as well as we did without the support of the city. Uh, Test and Trace did a phenomenal job uh, in providing access to testing for our visitors and for the local community. We had a testing van on Seaview's campus uh, in Staten Island, uh, I mean, around the clock. Without them, we would have we would have not been as successful as we were. Uh, we owe them a huge debt of gratitude. They did a phenomenal job standing up uh, their testing van. Uh, don't forget. Uh, at one point, uh, testing was not required for visitors, and then overnight, Department of Health and CMS aligned, of course, with CDC to say that all nursing home visitors need to be tested, and we got a van there right away. Without that, I, I don't know how we would have done it. So I owe my hats off to the city and for what they for what they did for us and for the resources that they provided. Uh, and we are now looking at uh, planning on expanding our admissions department, uh, which is, I think, a great way to help offload the burden and stress on some of the local hospitals. Uh, as what we learned in, during COVID is, uh, you know, when there's an influx of patients that are sitting in the ED or needing to be decanted to the hospitals, we want to make sure that we can help the hospitals breathe and, and appropriately place patients. So we have uh, internally reviewed our systems and protocols, and we are now able to take weekend admissions from our acute partners and from uh, acute facilities outside of our network at health and hospitals to better, you know, service the local community. That, that concludes my report. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to congratulate you once again and your colleagues at Seaview for the very high percentile ranking, 95% compared to others in the entire country. And you make us very proud with the work that you do. Well, thank you um, very much. And we appreciate the support. Please pass that along to everybody else there. Absolutely. I'd like to ask you a question about your equipment and infrastructure, because we're trying to get these into a position where we know exactly when you've made a request and who you've made the request to. So when you say we're requesting new hardware software, have you made that request formally in writing already? No. Have you? Uh, so we're in the process of going through, we have a, we have a uh, very specific electronic health record. Uh, unlike most of the facilities and health and hospitals use Epic, the post acute care service line uses point click care. So uh, any equipment that's introduced the interface with point click takes time. It has to be fully vetted. And then uh, when we have a product that we're interested in, we bring it to health and hospitals for vetting as well. So we have our we have an idea as to what area and what vendor we'd like to possibly select, but that's going to take some time to get off the ground. So you would then be talking about submitting this next year, correct? Perhaps, yes. Next fiscal year. Okay, that's fine, because I realize we're in May and all requests are in already. Yeah, so. Uh, there were correct. deadlines for borough presidents in February yeah. and so every borough was different. But I was just concerned about the timeline on that. So no. our when you su planning. submit a future report, if you say looking ahead towards fiscal uh, 24 25. or 25, it may 25, be. 25, really. 24 yeah. planning for us is Correct. done. So looking towards fiscal 20, it lets us know that you're on the ball, which I'm sure you are, with your high, high rating, but lets us know exactly where you are in the budget process, that you're not looking at this year, you're looking at next year, and you have to go through your internal reviews before you're ready for that. Yeah, and these are not, just to be clear, these are, they're not, obviously they're not that, they're not free by any stretch, but they're not overly expensive. So we think that we can certainly find the funding perhaps in FY25 to, you know, perhaps roll this out. And I think it's going to take a good year to make sure we have our eye on the right. And it's the right. It could be an expense item, but it depends on how much they cost. And, uh, right. and when, when you're at that point, then you'll figure which one, which, right. which, which basket it falls into. Are there any questions from any other board members? Yes, Ms. Adams. Hi. Hi. And uh, congratulations, as she has said. Um, you you talked about um, the testing, no more testing for um, when the visitors come Correct. to see their loved ones. It's no more testing. Uh, do they have to wear any criteria for them to wear masks or anything else? That's a, that's a great question. So currently, uh, the CDC does allow for nursing homes to not 
uh, require masking of staff and uh, visitors. The the trick there is, and you, everyone may know this, so if, if I'm, you know, I'll just repeat it. Uh, we still have to be masked if uh, we're not vaccinated for influenza, right? So the challenge you run into there is as the pandemic has, because of the pandemic and because of the masking, we're noticing that our influ notice of uh, our uh, influenza rates are still rather low on the staff side. So we made a decision at Seaview to keep people masked just to be safe. And uh, we, we thought it would be difficult to have the, uh, the staff not wearing masks and the visitors or vice versa. So the, the, the visitors are more than comfortable wearing a mask. We provide the mask for them uh, and the staff is still doing that as well. So we hope that the uh, flu season ends in, in the end of June and we'll be able to make a better determination what the plan is going forward. But, uh, and I hope I'm answering your question, but the, the requirement to wear the mask has sort of dissipated. As a service line, we're kind of keeping it in place for now until we see what happens in June with the flu, uh, with the flu season ending. Thank you. Thank Matthew, you. actually, that's no different than what we're doing in the other hospitals and clinical areas. Correct. Where we could make a discretionary decision to stop masking, but we are where we haven't because we think that um, while things are way better, the, the inconvenience to wear a mask while being around sick people doesn't weigh heavily against the risk of making someone who's immunosuppressed or, you know, quite ill sick. I mean, it's a different equation than it is when we're all here, right? When people can make a different level of decision ar around healthy people than around people who are in a hospital or a skilled nursing facility, a, a little extra care around people who are sick makes sense. Yep, completely agree, thank you. I want to thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, thank you so much. Give our best to be able to be back and see you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Moving on with the agenda, I'm going to uh, ask everybody to hold just for a second because I've been uh, reminded that in my anxiousness to move the meeting along and finish by six o'clock, I left somebody out. Now, I could tell you that I noticed that Dr. Katz was eating. And I can tell you that I was really, he needs to eat because he's a real slender guy and he's got to get that meal in. <laughs> I could tell you that. But I can't really tell you that in all honesty because I don't think anybody would believe me. But I see now that I think the end has come. He has had his meal. He's prepared to report to you. And I present to you our president, Dr. Mitchell Katz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I was not at all hurt. And I was glad to hear the sea view ahead of my presentation because I've spent my career trying to prove to people that the public sector can do as good a job as the private sector. Here, here. How many nursing homes are there in the state of New York? Over, six, over 600. There are 600 and it happens that the number one nursing home is a public nursing home. And if I could take credit for my colleagues, uh, the remaining uh, four skilled nursing facilities in our service line are also in the top 10. I'm, well, they're, they're also recognized. The so system can work. Um, and I'm also going to allow Roseanne to talk about the most exciting event of today. So I'm not going to mention that. Uh, she will talk about it. I will mention being at Woodhall uh, last week for our collaboration with Communal Life. We're opening up a second building. It was particularly nice because we're standing in the parking lot and we're looking at a very successful communal life one building and thinking you're going to now be 56 more units of supportive housing uh, for people who really need it who are from the hospitals uh, nyc care and metro plus health uh, will be working in staten island uh, to be sure that everybody stays covered um, and gets uh, reapplicated for their services uh, for health uh, insurance. Uh, New York State, uh, New York City Care and Metro Plus Health also had a resource fair to celebrate Immigrant Heritage Week in Staten Island. Um, we got the highest rating uh, for price transparency because while a lot of hospitals across the country say they're compliant with the transparency requirements, what they do is create a website so complicated that you couldn't possibly figure out the price of anything. But they get to say, well, if you 
you know, pull up our 11 spreadsheets and cross-reference them, you'll find the price. Well, it turns out if you just look on our website, we make it available to everyone. So we got the highest rating and we were very happy uh, to celebrate Immigrant Heritage Week um, because we are an organization, uh, both staff and patients full of immigrants who are proud of their background and proud to serve other immigrants. That's my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Katz. Uh, I appreciate that. We're now going to move on. Uh, we've been joined by uh, Mr. Corey Evans, the chair of Cumberland. Where's Mr. Evans? Yeah. Hi, how are you this I'll evening? Uh, are you ready to give your report? You have five minutes to do so. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So I'd like to welcome everyone to here today. Uh, Excuse me, help. can you speak into the microphone that's in front of you? It's not going to move, but if Hello? it's lit up, then you're fine. Yep. Can you hear me, sir? Yes. All right. Okay. Gotham Health Cumberland. COVID-19 responses. Currently, COVID-19 rates the hospitalizations have plateaued in, Bro in Brooklyn and across other boroughs. Cumberland COVID-19 vaccine pods were dismantled at the end of June 2022 and transitioned into the primary care departments where vaccines are made available for patients and staff. Cumberland continues to encourage its staff and patients to get boosters dose with new bilivinant boosters. Equipment and infra infrastructure. The radiology department replaced outdated imaging equipment to improve health screening care, delivery, and optimize patient outcomes. Dentistry <laughs> department expansion. Updating existing exam rooms to create modernized look. Replace outdated imaging equipment to improve health screening and care delivery and optimize patient outcome. Patient safety and satisfaction. They renovated the, the adult primary care exam rooms. They renovated the third floor registration area. Newly purchased ultrasound unit for the radiology department. Integration of kiosks, seven in total, to enhance the check-in process. Most, most patients have frequent complaints or patients and residents. So what they did to address these issues was communications and updates on wait time. The response, a diet train provided to all staff members and clinicians. Communication framework created by the, the Stutter Group for use of healthcare-based staff communicating with patients and each other to decrease patient anxiety, increase patients' compliance, and improve clinical outcomes. Access to appointments and reminders. Response to Luminum program sends texts reminding to the patients 24 and 48 hours before their appointment to show them that they have appointments scheduled. Issues impacting the community served by this facility. Challenges in the mental health services due to the shortage of providers. Access to healthier food options. And the last thing, acknowledgements. We would like to extend our gratitude to Cumberland clinical and operational leadership for their tireless commitment to serving the healthcare needs of the neighborhood in Brooklyn, as well as strategically partner, strategic, no, strategic partners who help amplify and impact our work, just the name a few. Brooklyn Borough President Antonio Renasso. New York State Senator Jabari Brisport, New York State Assembly Farrah Forrest, New York City Council Crystal Hudson, U.S. Congress Nydia Velasquez. Those are a few of the people that we like to thank and continue our work and efforts to. That's thank you, Mr. Evans, for your report. We really appreciate that. Thank you. I'd like to thank you and then the staff that that works with you down at uh, Cumberland for making the changes to the report so that all of your capital initiatives are in one section uh, on the one area of infrastructure and equipment. 
uh, what's most helpful to us for all all the various hospitals were here is if we know specifically what you're asking for. Right. Now we're in May. If we were in March or January, it would be earlier in the cycle. By by the time we're in May, it's done. If you haven't submitted something, it's uh, it, it's too late to submit. But the important thing is whatever doesn't get uh, accepted and funded in this year's capital budget should be first in line when you meet in, in September to determine what your needs are for next year. It's really very easy. For me, I know I spent 13 years in capital budget and it wasn't easy at the beginning, but after a while you get to know. And that's really what comes up with. That becomes your, the, 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 those become the projects that you then push for for the next year. And then you add other projects to it. So that makes it a lot easier for us to follow. It makes it easier for our external affairs staff to follow. Uh, and, uh, and this way we're in a better position to be of help to you. Um, Are there any questions at all from our board members? So on the, mm -hmm. Robert, on the sex reminders, you were saying that for access to appointment reminders, that sounds like a great idea to, for standard practice, you know, 24 right. hours, 48 hours. Especially to how the is that How is that going or? Especially to the elderly. So I, I, I think Ms. B will be able to answer that better. Hi, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, so Lumion is our text message campaign um, that sends a text message out to all the patients just regarding their appointment reminders. And we were able, originally, we were only utilizing this service for our primary care team departments. However, as of March 8th of this year, we were able to expand it to all of our specialty um, departments, excluding BH though. Um, it has been very impactful. Um, we're capturing more patients to help support decrease the no-show rate. Um, so we're in real time, just really outreaching to our patients. Okay, can you just identify yourself for the record? Oh, my apologies. My name is Wurola Sarita Dipeolu. I am Cumberland's administrator. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I was going to ask the same. Yes. I was going to ask about the text too, but I, what I want to add with the text, because some phones don't work sometimes, and sometimes people don't know know how to read text, and. Um, so what else do you have? Did you follow up with calls or anything? That's a great question. So our clerical team members also, in addition to Lumion, outreach to those who have not confirmed their appointments. Um, the best thing about Lumion is because it interfaces with Epic. So you're able to see those who confirmed via text message, and then we outreach to those patients who have not um, with a phone call, of course. Okay. Um, to make sure we capture all of our patients, we make three reminder calls as well, and that's going to be the 48 mark. Then we call them again at 24, and then we try to capture them same day in the morning time, of course. Very good. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. It sounds, sounds like a terrific system, yes. and I hope it works out really well for you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, any other questions again from our board members? Seeing that, I'd like to thank you so much, Mr. Evans, for your presentation, and, and thank you, your CEO and everybody else down in Cumberland. Thank you. Uh, I'd now like to introduce the uh, a, a friend for many, many years, because she's been coming before this board, uh, as long as I've been coming before this board, and perhaps, uh, uh, and she's always done a great job. The chair of uh, South Brooklyn Health, Mrs. Roseanne De Gennaro, for her report. Thank you so much. See you Thank again. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for having us here tonight. Anything happened today? Yeah. <laughs> oh, why would you ask that? <laughs> yes, we are so excited. Um, Svetlana Lipskaya is here, our, um, our uh, CEO, and we have Bridget here, Director of Public Affairs, and Keisha Weston, who is um, our liaison, our cab liaison. And I mentioned them because they were part of the team that really made today happen. It was a, we've waited so long. Like he said, we've known each other a long time. Yes, yes. Um, I was around when Sandy hit. I was around when they had to evacuate that hospital, mm -hmm. when everybody had to be taken out. I mean, they got them out. Not a life was lost, even, you know, the intensive care patients. It was amazing, but we should never have to go through that again. Um, God must have been on our side because we didn't lose anybody. Um, like I said, I would never I would never want to see that again. And I, I can remember that happened in um, October of 2012. 
And then January, I think it was either January or February 2013, we had our first CAB meeting. Now, in those days, we didn't use any virtual. So we hadn't talked to each, well, we talked like one-on-one, -on -one, but we had no group discussion. And we so wanted to be together and to talk and to vet. So we sat in this cold, freezing, damp room in the Hammett Pavilion, the building that they are going to tear down, mind you. Okay, and we sat there because we wanted to be together and we wanted to listen and we wanted to know when our hospital was coming back. And at that time, uh, Arthur Wagner was there. He says, it's coming back. Don't worry. It, it, it'll be there. And very shortly, we did come back. But who ever thought that that horrendous, tragic event would allow us now to have this beautiful, beautiful hospital? And I always say God has his plans. We were lucky. If we had lost one life, this hospital wouldn't have been worth it. But we didn't. So it is worth it. And it's beautiful. It's modern. It's state of the art. Um, it's a place that our staff, who Svetlana knows, I think are fantastic. Our doctors and our nurses. I'm a patient there. My husband was a patient there. We couldn't have gotten better care. Uh, they deserve to work in this kind of an atmosphere. And the residents that are in the community deserve to have that type of a hospital. So I have to thank health and hospitals. I have to thank all our elected officials, federal, state, city. Everybody had a hand in making today possible. So I have to thank everybody for that. So thank you. Now I could, I guess, get on with the rest of the report. <laughs> now you have time. Nothing is exciting as that. Nothing like is exciting as that. Okay, as far as uh, COVID-19 goes, um, it's everybody knows it's on the downside, but it's still out there. So there are days when we have no admitted cases, and then there are other days we might have one or two. We're at the lowest point that it's been since March of 2020. So we're happy with that. The infrastructure and the equipment, I spoke already about a wonderful hospital. Now I could say that um, we have a da Vin we have two Da Vinci yeah, two. robots, two Da Vinci robots. And uh, as of April 30th, we completed 385 surgeries using those robots. Uh, they started us with one and then they saw what we were doing and they gave us another one, which is wonderful. And we're, we far exceeded everyone's act expectations on this. They never thought we would get to have this many surgeries, but we have competent doctors there and nurses, so we were able to do it. Um, we received an $18.5 million grant from the Brooklyn Borough President Reynoso uh, for a woman's health, health initiative project, okay? Now, as far as the patient safety and satisfaction, um, the executive leadership is committed to improving the culture of safety among the staff. Um, a culture safety survey was conduct, conducted in the fall of 2021, which resulted in the three C's initiative. That is connect, continue, and complete. And that started in January of 2023. Also, we have the patient safety department will implement the bio vigil hand hygiene program and a pilot project began to identify and address the patient safety indicates. Uh, complaints, um, communication responsiveness and long wait times continue to be a most, the most frequent complaints. Loss of patient property from the ED to the inpatient unit is also an issue. But several initiatives have been, have been implemented now by the medicine, emergency department, patient relation and patient experience departments. And these are frequent rounding by patient representatives on the units. Issues are resolved in real time prior to escalation to a grievance and asking patients if they have any property to book upon admission going into the units from the ED. So that's that. Now issues impacting the community, violence, as in all communities all over the country is a huge concern of our community. At one time, most of the incidents happened during the day 
now during uh, during the, the nighttime after dark, but now it's happening 24 hours a day. The hospital took the lead in addressing these problems by holding an anti-gun violence panel discussion in February. They invited community-based organizations, the police, elected officials, and of course our own doctors to be part of this panel. All these factors must join together to come up with a cure, a solution to make our streets safe again. So I have to thank Svetlana and her team for opening up this discussion. I don't think that happened anywhere else. Uh, we were very we were happy with that. The community came and the community heard that the hospital is concerned. Now with all this violence, gun violence, it brings us to our other community concern issue. We want and we need and deserve a level one trauma center in Southern Brooklyn. The nearest level one center is more than 25 minutes away. Besides the already numerous NYCHA developments, condos, amusement area, the beaches, and of course, our nearest neighbor, the Bell Parkway, they are now lining our streets and avenues with tremendous number of new high rises. Every time you hear on the news of a violent crime or a car accident right at our door, they always follow it with the patient was taken to the hospital, but never Coney Island. I'm sorry, South Brooklyn Hill. Mm -hmm. Okay, many times the person, patient dies. When time is one of the most important factors in saving a life, why are we denied it? With our new, most modern state-of-the-art facility, it's time to place this request, which I have for many years asked before, to put, a, put this issue on the table. We really need this and we deserve it. And it, it's just, I know it takes a long time, but it has to start someplace. So I hope it starts here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions from our board members? Yes, yes Jackie. So I hear you and I know what you're saying. Um, because some out there dealing with the violence issues. So my is, is, is basically two questions. You mentioned that when you had the summit, let's call it a summit with everybody coming together um, and the police, you know, was there. Uh, which precinct are y'all? We're 60th, but uh, uh, Mandare, is that his, um, he's a, he's the, um, he comes right from the commissioner. Oh, Chief Mandre. Chief Mandre, yeah. Okay, so he was there. So my question is any follow up with the police working closely with the hospital police? How is that relationship and did you keep it up and did they continue to reach out? Because that plays a big part. So can I yes, answer? you can answer that. <laughs> so I'm Svetlana Lipanska, the CEO of South Brooklyn Health. Um, we have a very close relationship with the 60th precinct. And so we continue working with them. Our hospital police uh, chief actually comes from, from the police. Uh, he was a community affairs liaison um, for a very long time and so has a very, very close relationship uh, with the police partners. We're also working on outreaching the community folks who are part of the panel so that we can really create some, some pathways for employment, some Excellent. pathways for um, mentorship. Uh, and, and that is really how uh, we think that we can help impact this problem is to go to the community um, and work with the community partners at the high school and uh, other levels. And so that is going to be our focus going forward. Absolutely. That that's really good and continue it. Don't you know, continue it because that do play a big part and it does help drive down the crime. Then I heard you. Well, you didn't beg real hard, did she, Dr. Katz? <laughs> <laughs> Not on the scale of begging really hard to me for things, no. So I heard you mention about the trauma mm -hmm. uh, 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 program department, and, and I did have the privilege of being with you today. Um, if you're saying there's so much violence out there and you're getting in a lot of shootings, they come to that high, you're overwhelmed with the trauma. That's what you're saying. 
When that over, you mean the community is overwhelmed. The, community, the, the hospital the, could handle. The hospital. Okay, so but you're saying you need a level one trauma. So so okay. that's what happens. We're we're a trauma center. We're a stroke center, but we're not a level one trauma so center. That's what I'm saying. And I know that that takes there's there's a lot needed in order to be designated as a level one trauma center. Okay. But I'm just saying, can you imagine 25? 25 minutes to get somebody that that is bleeding and 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 they they have to go to this someplace else other than and they pass by the hospital that's the best part and then then i was thinking about something else i was thinking about families i was thinking the family isn't going to get to the hospital in time to see that person and they died so you're saying a number one like so we have to be a level one trauma let's okay number one is that enough dr katz yeah I mean, you you already know it has at a, at a minimum for the state and the board to certify a trauma center. It has to be fifteen hundred trauma I know. admissions a I know. year. I don't know where Coney Island know. is. I don't know, but I know we need it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm asking. How many? Right. We. I mean, have to. Have, I mean, it's not a simple question. You have to no. look at how many traumas there are. Right. Then you have to look at well, but how many people? got diverted somewhere else. Right. Right. Which I'm going to get those numbers. Point of view, right. <laughs> uh, it's not, turns out it's not so easy to get the other numbers. No. It's no. easy to get the number of traumas that are brought to uh, South Brooklyn Health. Very hard to figure out how many of the people brought elsewhere would have gone to uh, South Brooklyn Health. Uh, trauma sense is a very controversial issue. Uh, in recent times, looking at, at another request, out in the Rockaways, which is related because not too far. You know, the whole state of Montana has zero level one trauma centers. Really? The whole state. Hmm. Right. I mean, New York, we are privileged in right the number of trauma centers we have and Manhattan and the borough of Manhattan especially. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, compared to the borough of Manhattan, right, which uh, I don't even Bellevue, uh, NYU, uh, Mount Sinai, Harlem. Uh, right, so I'm already up to five for just the island of Manhattan. So of course, then everybody else says, you know, whether it's the Bronx or Queens or, you know, Brooklyn, right, compared to Manhattan, right, we're all far from a trauma center. Uh, so it's a very... It's a very complicated issue. I know. I, I know. I do say want to point out in 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 uh, support of what Rosanna is saying. The emergency department at South Brooklyn Health has saved many a life yes. of someone who was in a serious car accident on the Belt Parkway. Mm -hmm. Because the reality is, even though it's not a level one trauma, the ambulance drivers know that if time is of essence, you should bring them to South Brooklyn Health because right. yes. it's a very capable emergency department. Oh, very capable, the best. And I got a, I got a privilege and honor today to, of seeing it, doctor. It was, it's just beautiful. Everything, kudos to you guys. But the thing, it, it's beautiful, but, they, but what makes it is the staff, the doctors and the nurses. And I, the I agree with you and the CEO. Let's yes, of course. <laughs> Speaking of the CEO, I want to thank Svetlana for being here today. Uh, it's been a wonderful day for your hospital and a wonderful day for the yes. entire borough of Brooklyn. My wife is a Gravesend girl. I know Mitch over here is a Sheepshead Bay boy. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of folks in Brooklyn uh, who are going to really be benefiting by the expansion of the services that you are able to provide. With that, I want to thank both of you and Roseanne. It's good to see you again. And good thank you for your report. We are now at uh, 14 minutes of six. We have two hospitals to go. So we have to squeeze in our two hospitals within that uh, 14 minute span. So I'd like to thank you once again for your pre presentation and call on Mr. Ambrose Nagande from Lincoln Hospital to make his presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, How are you everyone? tonight? I'm doing well, thank good. you. Uh, <clears throat> As a member of Lincoln Hospital Community Advisory Board, we join with the administration to advocate and serve the community for the community and the hospitals to achieve, to provide the best possible healthcare to our community. The hospital administration keeps us informed of all new endeavor, initiative and programs. We are here as a team to work together 
to better serve our community. COVID-19 response. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us how important it is to work together. At Lincoln, we witness every department and staff member come together to care for some of the sick patients we have ever seen. We witness departments that were previously sil siloed work together. We met passionate care caregiver from the department that we would not have met or worked with had it not been to the pandemic. During the early wave, as we learned how to care for these patients and protect our staff, very few staff came down with COVID. A testament to their understanding on protecting themselves while caring for the patient. We witnessed Hundreds of people from our community die from this virus. We witnessed the pain and suffering of the family who could not visit or hold the hand of their family member. We witnessed our own staff suffer with the loss of each patient. Now, as the public health emergency comes to an end, we have had no staff test positive for COVID at Lincoln, and the number of patients admitted to the hospital with COVID has diminished tremendously. We will take the lesson learned on how to care for patients with a novel illness, how staff can work together for a common purpose and improve the care experience for our community and our caregivers. Great news, expansion of dental clinic the Vinci robotic program, multifaceted and full integration approach to uh, minimally inv invasive surgery. A critical care unit with bed upgrade. Patient safety and satisfaction. We have shifted to an electronic system voice and enable all staff docu document patient safety concern. Good catches or near misses, adverse event including drug reaction, fall return to OR, etc., as well as staff input on either care delivery or communication among staff, both in behavior and non behavior unit. This is monitored by Office of Quality Management. This was put in place to strike the to make our patients safe and get equitable care. Frequent complaint. Complaint raised by a patient, resident go to the guest relation department, which provide a centralized mechanism for patient and visitor to express their concern and provide feedback through suggestion and complaint. Main complaint is loss of personal property. At Lincoln, the administration has established a patient property task force partner with the planetary organization, an inpatient performance improvement project now include patient representative as a lead. The property, the property task force has piloted an ED trauma patient property point person in, in an effort to decrease loss and increase prop, proper documentation. That concludes my report. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Are there any questions for Lincoln Hospital and their report? I have none, but thank you so much for taking your time to come down here and give our best to your CEO. You, uh, finally, we have uh, uh, also from the Bronx, Mr. Aunt Mariano Laboy from Arsenia. Mr. Laboy, it's good to see you again. Thank you. Go right ahead with your report. Thank you, Mr. Chair, board members. Uh, join all of us at Morisani and celebrating our 50th anniversary providing services to our very important Oh, community. that's wonderful. 50 years. We join 50 years of hard working, but we are providing our very best. Thank to all of you. Board members, COVID-19 COVID response. Currently, COVID-19 community transmission is low in the Bronx and across the other boroughs. 
Rapid COVID-19 home testing kits are available for free distribution to patients and staff. Morisane continues to encourage staff and patients to get a booster dose of the new bivalent boosters. As of June 30, 2022, Morisane is no longer providing community testing vaccinations. Let's emphasize one thing, Morisane wearing masks for staff and patients is mandatory. Equipment and building a structure system. Updating the women's and men's locker room in progress. Implementing wellness room and the first floor is in progress. Security has been and behavioral health approved. Minor's bathroom repair has been completed and no longer out of service. Equipment building structure system. Continuation. For fiscal year 24 consideration, the, follow, the following capital funding priorities were submitted in, in January and February 2023 to the Brown Borough President and New York City. Dental suite renovation, ADA compliant main entry, dental imaging equipment, pediatric dentistry, patient education center, new imaging equipment, asthma pediatric suite, suite lobby modernization, optometry patient, bathroom renovation, ADA complaint. Patient safety and satisfaction, creation of the community resource centers, launch a managerial rounding for more patient feedback, increase CBO partnership for on-site tabling, repair one of the bathroom petition lock and have been out of services, integration of the care system and the pump being scanner. Frequent complaints by patient. Patient wait time, long waiting time to be called and a time to spend in, in the building. I myself, uh, at least once or twice a week, uh, we question patients when they're out of seeing the doctor to see how they're doing, how the services have been provided. And the only minor complaint that we have have been the waiting time. And we're working on that. And um, we're for sure that we're going to fix that problem. Long waiting for next appointment for new patients. We're working on that too. Shortage of provide an adult medicine. Access to the pharmacy, a shortage of staff. Issues impacting the community served by the facility. Access to healthy food options. We have created community partnership to promote nutrition and healthy lifestyle. Corbin Health Farm Fresh Food Program, Food Share Program, New York Common Pantry. As you know, the Browns in our area, we don't have too many healthy places to buy food. Believe me, we don't. Mm -hmm. I've been there for 52 years, and believe me, we have to go out of the scope to many other places in order to obtain healthy food. And we thank you, all those people that are, are helping us in that. Uh, and this issue, access to immigration support and legal services, New York Legal Assistant Group, service appointment Brown Defenders, access to other social services. We are working with Brown North profits, including Brown World, Bridge Builders, and Miss Brown's Senior Citizen Council, uh, Senior City Council to promote better access to housing support services, substance abuse and counseling, and employment services. And Excuse me, Mr. LeBoy, can you sum up? In about 30 seconds. Okay. I know you're near the very end. Okay, we have the, the, the acknowledgement. Uh, we would like to extend our gratitude to Mauritania's operational leadership, Dr. O'Connell, Medical Director, Joaquin Santos, Dep Deputy Director, Cristina Gamares, Mr. Sajero, and Mr. Dominguez, for the tireless commitment to services of healthcare needed in our neighborhood in the Bronx, our forest strategic, and to work. And to Nathan, Borough President, uh, Vanessa Gibson, and New York City Council of the Achievement, New York Senator Honor Sotano, New York Assembly Winner Amanda Septimo, U.S. Congress, here, Richard Torres. And a personal note, uh, I want to express my gratitude to uh, community resident to Mr. Dominguez. He's living in Mauritania for a very job in the corporation and health in the hospital with Mr. Dominguez. Thank you. I've been a pleasure <laughs> working with you and with that, I conclude. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. We appreciate your, your time. Are there questions for Mr. LeBoy?
I have a, a, a comment, which is I'd like to work with you on the wait times for appointments. While people put the two things together, fixing waiting times for a future appointment, that can be a hard problem because that, that requires access and enough doctors and nurses, and there are true workforce issues. Seeing people in a timely way, that should be an easy problem to solve because if people are waiting too long, all it means is you've given them the wrong time. Mm. Right. If someone, if somebody is waiting till 1130 and you, because you gave them a 930 appointment and it's two hours, it's an easy problem to fix. You have to give them the 1130 appointment. And it's not unusual that, that the templates and when people are told to come is wrong, right? People are told to come way too early sometimes, or the schedule is unrealistic in terms of when somebody fixes. It. So one problem very hard to solve because it requires hiring more doctors and nurses in, in a workforce area where it's difficult. Getting people seen within the time that the appointment is should be easy to solve. It just requires giving people the right appointment. Um, so that would be one I, I would enjoy working with you on. You're welcome. Thank Richard. you, doctor. Um, I'd like to thank you for your presentation once again. Is there any old business? Is there any new business? Okay, before I uh, adjourn the meeting, I want to recognize our senior vice president, Deborah Brown, who is here with us today, as she always is, and Okenfe, who has provided great service when we go through this, uh, uh, the agenda the month, the week before, sometimes things need to be clarified, and uh, he is the clarifier in chief. <laughs> Make sure he gets on the phone to the various hospitals, and there are minor changes about putting things on page three instead of four, and he gets those done, and he also deals with the substantive matters. So thank you so much for your help. Seeing nothing else, I've declared this meeting adjourned, and our next meeting will be Tuesday, September 12th at five o'clock. Thank you.